Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. Maybe having more specific policies surrounding the assessment of mental health in at-risk populations in combination with some type of resilience training could be supported by provider training or increased funding. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Postpartum depression is a common condition among people who give birth. Within four weeks of childbirth, 13% of women experience postpartum depression, with as many as 19% of women affected three months postpartum. Mothers who experience postpartum depression are more likely to experience impaired mother-infant bonding, which has been linked to increased risk for infant maltreatment and socio-emotional, behavioral, and cognitive problems. Now, acute stress during pregnancy can increase the risk of postpartum depression. The current global COVID-19 pandemic represents a stressor that may have significant repercussions for postpartum depression risk and mother-child relationship development. The relationship between COVID-19, postpartum depression, and mother-infant bonding is the topic of today's health policy. I'm here with Sarah Cornfield, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Cornfield and colleagues published a paper in the October 2021 issue of Health Affairs about mental health and resilience among women who were pregnant during the early lockdown phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Their analysis suggests that prenatal depression is an important risk factor that predicts postpartum depression and uniquely contributes to impaired mother-infant bonding. We'll discuss this finding and many more on today's episode. Dr. Cornfield, welcome to the program. Thanks, Alan. Happy to be here. I'm eager to discuss with you the findings in your paper and the context that we can place those findings in. This is such an important topic and it affects so many people. Let's start with some of the basics that may not be familiar to everyone. What are the risks associated with postpartum depression for the parent and for the child? Yeah, it's a great place to start. So we know that postpartum depression, as you said, is exceedingly common with as many as one in five women who are likely to be affected within one year of giving birth or bringing home a new baby. Uh, For a parent, the risks uh, associated with untreated postpartum depression can be a long-term course of chronic depression. Um, Other issues can also arise like drug and alcohol abuse in the postpartum, obesity or difficulty losing the uh, post-baby weight, which puts women at risk for other health risks um, in the long term. Uh, There can be problems with breastfeeding um, and getting that established early enough in the uh, bonding phase between mother and child. And there can be also difficulties in a mother's primary relationship with her partner or other members of the family. Uh, For some parents, as you mentioned, depression can contribute to difficulty bonding with their new infant or being able to take care of them appropriately. For a baby, having a caregiver with postpartum depression can result in the poor uh, social or emotional development, and we also see problems in behavioral or cognitive uh, development at preschool age, and uh, there can also be risks for additional psychopathology later in life. So it seems like this term postpartum depression almost sends us off in the wrong direction because it makes it sound like it's time limited. You have it and then it goes away. But what you're describing is something that can have lasting effect for both the mother and the baby, even if its onset is just associated with this particular time period. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. I think that a lot of people think of the postpartum as being a really time limited, you know, to within you know, six to 12 weeks um, after a baby's born, um, usually sort of associated with the same amount of time that we consider maternity leave. And then we expect that when a mom, you know, goes back to work, baby goes to daycare, everything is sort of copacetic and back to normal. But we know that um, really for mothers, uh, the postpartum period can be as long as one year in terms of that recovery from the experience of pregnancy and childbirth. And so certainly during that time, you're really thinking about, um, a, a truly uh, like plastic neuroplastic uh, window for the infant. Um, and so a lot of the, the development that happens there can have lifelong consequences. Okay. So your paper looks at the risks associated with postpartum depression. Let's talk about some of the risks, but I also want to talk about resilience, which is a concept you use in the paper as well. So give us a sense of what some of the risks are, and then also give us a sense of 
what resilience factors are and why they're important to look at at the same time as you're looking at risk. Yeah. So the the uh, risk factors that we examined in this paper were uh, the experience of having pre-existing depression. So pre we call it prenatal depression in the paper, uh, prenatal anxiety, and also the experiences of adverse childhood events, which refers to uh, you know negative experiences that children can have in their upbringing, usually before the age of eighteen, which are usually um, conceptualized as um, issues around neglect um, or abuse or threat in, in childhood development, usually associated with caregiver relationships. So uh, resilience factors can be defined in lots of different ways. And so for the purposes of our study, we're referring to resilience factors that are protective against negative outcomes and also promote positive outcomes. Um, and we thought the resilience factors are really important in times of stress such as during pregnancy and the postpartum, which are already stressful. And we know that there's already an increased vulnerability to mental health disorders during this time period. And then especially so in the case of this global pandemic, where there was so much uncertainty and, and distress for all people, not, not just uh, pregnant or postpartum mothers. Um, and the resilience factors that we looked at specifically were emotion regulation, uh, social support, non-hostile, non-hostility and close relationships, and perceived neighborhood safety. Okay, so you're taking this very stressful moment in a person's life. You're looking at the precursors that might lead to postpartum depression. You're also looking at the context that might be protective. But as you said, your study takes place during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. So how d did you design this thinking, oh, well, we're going to study it this way? Or did you say, we want to study these two, and now we've got to figure out what to do with COVID? Like, how did COVID come into the picture here? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, there's been quite a few research groups that have had the opportunity, as now we have, unfortunately, of examining um, similar constructs in a group of people who were all exposed to a universal stressor. So our research group was actually already interested in how stress exposures in a pregnant person's life could affect their future functioning and that of their offspring. Um, and we were actually working together to gear up to write a grant um, in the late uh, winter, early spring of 2020, and um, then COVID happened. And at first we thought, well, this is such a disaster. You know, how can you, you know, beyond the fact that we're all, you know, horribly stressed and, you know, working from home and dealing with children and worried about our own health and safety, you know, how can we get any research done in this context? But um, it gave us a, a window into this universal experience of stress. And so because we're a group made up of researchers and clinicians, psychiatrists, psychologists, obstetricians, maternal fetal medicine specialists, pediatricians, we were able to really quickly mobilize to recruit this cohort of women who were pregnant during this initial wave of COVID in the U.S. Uh, so although it wasn't our initial hope, um, you know, obviously I think we all hope that something like this will never happen in our lifetimes. We were able to to really, um, I think, capitalize on this unfortunate experience in order to hopefully, you know, figure out what we can do to improve the situation for people who find themselves in this, you know, in, in this conundrum. And since you're uh, referring to the study that we published, just say a little bit more about the population you recruited because understanding the implications here definitely depends on understanding who it is you talk to. Can you just say a bit more about that? Yeah. So our sample was made up of around 900 women who were um, pregnant at any stage of their pregnancy, receiving their prenatal care through um, the University of Pennsylvania hospital system um, in Philadelphia um, at any of our outpatient prenatal clinics. And so we recruited these patients through um, um, emails, email, um, recruitment that was, um, you know, we sent them surveys, um, but we, we've identified these women by whether or not they were enrolled in our Penn Medicine, you know, online portal. So we were able during this, you know, difficult time when people weren't really coming into the hospital for unnecessary, you know, research studies or procedures um, to identify them using, you know, our, our technology to get them um, enrolled and uh, taking part in the research. And since you have such a robust set of knowledge and skills among your study team. On the one hand, you did mobilize around COVID, but if we were to try to generalize about stress, do you have a sense of whether the stressors associated with co the COVID pandemic are similar to the other kinds of stress people giving birth confront so that we can sort of generalize, or is this really kind of a COVID study? 
Well, that's a good question. I think it's both, right? Because we're looking at COVID as like a really particular context, but also I think it can sort of be a stand-in for any type of acute stressor that um, someone might experience during, you know, during their pregnancy or early postpartum phase. Um, so in general, individuals are pretty unique in their experiences of stress during pregnancy. Um, but COVID was a, was a universal experience of stress. And so I think many women are reasonably anxious as they anticipate, you know, uh, you know, th things in their pregnancy, like the health of their pregnancy, the health of their baby, what childbirth will be like, what it will be like to bring a new baby home into their family. But COVID really added additional stressors and uncertainty, including, as I'm sure we can all relate to, you know, fears about our own or our loved one's health and safety, distress about job loss and finances. Um, but then more specifically to pregnancy, also uh, fears about going into the hospital to give birth. Um, you know, can you imagine what that might have felt like for someone where they're saying, like, stay home, don't go out. And then you're having to go to the most, you know, germy or contaminated feeling place. Um, you know, will they even have room for me if it's a hospital that's, you know, very full with COVID, sick COVID patients? Um, what if I get COVID at the hospital? Um, you know, can my partner be there to support me? Will I have to wear a mask while I'm laboring? So these were, I think, the more specific issues that led to the experience of stress around pregnancy during COVID. Yeah, it's also important to remember that um, our study data was gathered during the very early stages of the pandemic, and we were all still seeing those materials and resources shortages, like if you couldn't get any toilet paper during that time. Um, for, for pregnant and postpartum women, there might, may also have been concerns about, can I get diapers? Can I get formula for my baby? We've spent a lot of time talking about the context of your study, and I'm eager for us to talk about the findings. Uh, we'll do that after we take a short break. Before hitting the floors of Congress, health policy begins in the pages of Health Affairs. Stay up to date with the latest research and insights by subscribing to the leading health policy journal. Subscribers have exclusive access to health affairs research, ahead of print articles, and resource pages. Subscribe today by visiting our website at www.healthaffairs.org. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Sarah Cornfield about risk and resilience factors influencing postpartum depression and mother-infant bonding during COVID-19. Before the break, you set out the context of the research. Now let's Turn to the findings. Uh, you're focused on the likelihood of developing postpartum depression. What factors did you find contribute to that negative outcome? Sure. So in our study, the risk factors that we investigated as being associated with an increased risk of developing postpartum depression were prenatal depression. So whether or not women had depression that pre-existed, um, giving birth, uh, similarly prenatal anxiety disorders, and um, having experienced adverse childhood events. And um, we also found that women who were more worried about COVID-related pregnancy concerns in their third trimester um, you know, were more likely also to develop postpartum depression. So that was another, another risk factor that we investigated was that COVID-specific worry. And then you also looked at uh, mother-child bonding, mother-infant bonding. Talk about the findings of uh, related to that. Sure. So individually, uh, we found that prenatal depression and anxiety and adverse childhood events all contributed to impaired mother-infant bonding. However, after we controlled for postpartum depression symptoms, which we know are influenced by those factors, only the prenatal depression remains a significant predictor for mother-infant bonding. So basically, there's this pathway through postnatal depression to barriers to mother-infant bonding. Is that the right way to think about it? And the factors that were dominant in leading to the likelihood of having de uh, postpartum depression are the same factors that then make it likely that there will be uh, impediments to the bonding? Yes. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Yes. And let's talk about resilience because that, as you said at earlier on was a, is a critical element here. So if we're trying to, given, given that uh, prenatal depression isn't something we can necessarily prevent entirely, um, let's talk about what opportunities there are or 
what resilience factors are at play that might mitigate the effects of that and and the other risk factors. Right. So individually, the risk, the resilience factors, excuse me, um, that we measured were self-reliance, um, which is, you know, how confident you feel about your ability to, you know, get things done, accomplish things on your own, um, you know, be your own advocate, uh, emotion regulation. So the ability to uh, manage your own feelings and emotions, um, you know, either con- have some sense of control over your own um, emotional expression. Uh, social support, which is, you know, whether or not you have people in your life who can support you, take care of you, help you out. Um, non-hostility and close relationships, which is related to, you know, do people in your life kind of an- annoy you, bother you, irritate you on purpose, um, and then perceived neighborhood safety. And so we found that all of these re- resilience factors were protective against the development of postpartum depression. But when we looked at all the factors together um, and and sort of like um, examined them as a, you know, conglomerate, only emotion regulation was really significant. So, and again, emotion regulation refers to being able to kind of manage your your feelings, like, for example, distract yourself when you're having a negative emotion or, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of have some sense of control over your expression of emotion. Now comes the fun part. So we're a, we're a policy journal and your findings seem to me to have very direct clinical application. Uh, we should screen for these. We should potentially help people with the skills that might give them resilience. Um, but from a public policy perspective, how do we take findings like these and think about what could be done at a policy level, not at an individual clinical level? Yeah, that's a good question. So, and that's, I think, a hard question for our group to think about because we're mostly, you know, researchers and clinicians, and we tend to think about our individual patients and what could help them most. So, expanding that, I think, was a challenge for the purpose of the paper. Um, but I think what we thought would be most useful is. Um, how policymakers could help promote the increased access to treatment programs that not only target mental health, but prioritize resilience building during that perinatal period for individuals and families. And we know that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, recommends universal mental health screenings during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Um, But I think maybe having more specific policies surrounding the assessment of mental health and trauma specifically in at-risk populations in combination with some type of resilience training, um, you know, could be supported by provider training or increased funding for those type of integrated mental health um, opportunities in obstetric care settings. And we think about, um, you know, women who are coming in for prenatal care as this at ri- potentially at-risk group. Um, and what is kind of nice about that is that women who do seek out prenatal care are kind of a captive audience in their obstetrics and gynecology offices. They're there very regularly, and they develop nice long-term relationships with their clinicians and providers. So, you know, having more education um, for those providers around um, promoting training in Areas like, you know, looking out for trauma, assessing trauma, um, and being able to offer maybe preventative-oriented treatments during pregnancy could really help. You know, I'm struck uh, a couple of the papers in the October issue, um, I think, are relevant to this conversation. One that was qualitative work showing that some of the screening for depression is actually not uh, handled very well and that uh, patients themselves don't feel like it's assessing them very accurately. Um, Another, which I want to bring in here particularly, is this notion of sort of asset-based versus deficit-based approaches. I mean, resilience is something positive. And I wonder if, and I suppose this does straddle the clinical policy world, but I wonder if there are aspects of our policies that get in the way of building from people's strengths and instead sort of lead us down this path of diagnosis and treatment uh, to get rid of a problem. Is there anything to this? Yeah, I think that's actually a great point because the way that that our medical systems kind of work is that in order to be eligible for treatment, you have to have a diagnosis. And so if there's nothing 
I'll put it in quotes, like if there's nothing wrong with you, then you don't qualify to receive these services. Um, and that becomes an issue when you think about, you know, um, third party payers and insurance reimbursements, uh, you know, for offering things like um, a resilience training workshop during pregnancy um, or, you know, some kind of family based therapy to bring dads in and get fathers involved. Um, so I think that's a really great point that there is this barrier to being able to offer these more, um, you know, well woman focused uh, uh, or even well family focused um, preventative interventions. Wouldn't it be interesting if we did resilience assessments and if you, again, it sounds bad when I say it, but you know, if it shows that you would fare better if you were higher on the resilience score, that that then brought with it the same resources that a diagnosis of depression would bring. That would be a very, that would be a pretty different world, wouldn't it? I think so. Yeah, that would be great too, because you could identify people so early and, and these, you know, the resilience factors are really modifiable targets, you know, so, so I think they respond very well to, you know, training, to therapy, to, to group interventions, all of which I think we could make fairly, um, you know, efficient and affordable from a, from a perspective of, you know, who's going to pay for this? How are we going to get it into our systems? So before I let you go, I have to ask what comes next. This is so interesting, but as you noted, you modified the approach based on the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're certainly not out of it, but we're not at that early lockdown phase. Um, do you see yourself sort of coming back to this question in a non-COVID period and sort of re rewinding to where you thought you were going to be? Or are there modifications to what you want to look at, uh, given what you've learned here? What, what What's next in your uh, scholarship? Yeah, I love this question. So I think we actually kind of focusing on on two things moving forward. One is, as you said, kind of working backwards to what some of our original goals are, because, you know, with or without COVID, postpartum depression and um, exposures, uh, you know, ma maternal exposures in utero to children are, are, are not going away. Um, so we have to always be thinking about how can we improve the lives of the women that we treat and their children. Um, and to that end, also, our second focus is thinking about ways to follow up the children that were born to these women during the pandemic and find out how they're doing, you know, how are they developing? Have they been negatively impacted by the things that their mothers experienced in their pregnancies? Um, and how resilient are they? Well, I'm glad I asked because those are some great topics and I look forward to uh, finding out what you learn and maybe publishing some more papers on those. Um, Dr. Cornfield, thank you so much for the paper, the scholarship here. And uh, the conversation, I learned a great deal, and I'm excited about where you're taking this area of study. Thanks so much for being my guest on A Health Policy. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I also just want to extend thanks to all my colleagues in the Ignite group at Penn um, and CHOP, and also all the women who participated in our studies. We really couldn't do it without them, so appreciate it. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about A Health Policy. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Julia Vivolo, Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Policy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.